What's up, weeds and casuals alike, and welcome to the most glorious chaotic podcast about anime this side of the digital universe. We are Baka and Company, and we are here to provide you with a deep dive into all your favorite anime shows and movies. We'll cover both new and old and everything in between. I'm your bird guide, Drew Tendo64, followed by my two co-hosts, the mad uncle of the arcane, Magically Average. Oh yeah, this is when we talk. Hello. <laughs> <laughs> And the fisherman of the astral plane, it's Frankfurter. Oh, it's a big one. <laughs> That's today not... we're talking. <laughs> oh, whatever. <laughs> well, today we're talking about The Boy and the Heron, directed by Hayao Miyazaki, who won't retire, written by him as well, produced by Studio Ghibli, and music where it was heard by Joe Hisasashi. And just to start things off, so The Boy and the Heron's the new Ghibli movie. Uh, it recently came out here in North America. Um, just kind of main plot points. Young boy during World War II loses his mom during firebombing. He's sad. He moves to a new place in Japan. Gets a new mom. He's sad. Um, and then we'll go from there. So just kind of surface level thoughts, because uh, I see Frank losing his mind. Uh, Frank. So, okay. Before all is said and done, I, I did enjoy the journey of this film. I think that it's going to be a little bit harder to critique it because this is more art for art's sake than it was anything else. Um, I mean, there is a lot to unpack with it. And theme-wise, voice acting, I'm the only one here of the three of us that watched it dubbed. I think they knocked it out of the park. Um, honestly, the only voice that you could really tell was them was Dave Bautista. Like, and he played the Parakeet King, and he was in it for all of, like, three scenes. Other than that, that the voice cast did an amazing job. Uh, but, yeah, there's there's a lot that I want to say, and I know that uh, we'll, we'll get into it, but just top-level thoughts for you, Magically Average, before we really dive into it. I thought it was one of the more well-put-together Miyazaki films, in terms of start to finish. That's just my, that's my thought. I, I thought, cause I was thinking when we were, when I was in the theater with my wife afterwards, we were watching the credits and I was going through kind of in my mind, the other ones we've watched so far from Miyazaki. And I was like, you know what? In all honesty, this one had a very clear and pointed message. It had a consistent pace to it throughout didn't, there wasn't any lull periods like you see in a lot of his other films. Uh, ending was a little bit abrupt, but that's, I don't know, that's just kind of his shtick, I feel like. Uh, and I thought the overall plot points they went through were really well done and thought out. I enjoyed it a lot. I think I'm going to have varying, I think I'm going to be the one that has the more opposite opinions than the two of you. So I'm excited to get into it. All right. Well, I I enjoyed a lot of it. Similar to how Frank said it, like it it's very artful. It's very nice. Well, not nice. Even just captivating <laughs> to look at. It's uh, I I spent a lot of time just kind of staring and spacing out with some of the scenes, um, and just kind of forgetting that I was there to like <laughs> eventually critique and and report back on a movie. So I enjoyed that fact that it kind of took me out of my own um, mind and, and brought me into this universe and just kind of pulled me along. Um, there, the pacing, I felt, points, was either extremely fast and, and getting somewhere and then just putting on the brakes and letting you kind of absorb the situation you were in and then skipping to the next thing. But... Overall, I did enjoy it. Um, it's not going to be my my top Ghibli film, but it's uh, I'm gonna say you know what maybe top five. So with that, um, just kind of diving deeper into the plot. So we have spoilers Mahi ahead. Yeah, spoilers ahead. So if you haven't seen it, why are you listening? Um, we have our main protagonist uh, Mahito. Um, so he's there in Japan at the height of World War Two. Um, Living in his family's home, uh, firebombing happens. Uh, unfortunately, those firebombs hit the hospital that his mom's in, in hospice care. Um, obviously, things get worse. She passes away, and we kind of time skip to, to him uh, now leaving his childhood home and moving 
um, further away from his family um, because his dad is remarrying and that's kind of a shock to him. He's just not really interested in who this person is. But true. Kind of, who does yeah. his dad remarry? Yeah. Oh, here's the fun fact. The sister of his wife. So the younger literally, sister. Yeah, the younger sister. So he's marrying his aunt. Upgrade. His son's aunt. Woo! <laughs> and Jesus. she has no chill. Like, she's barely introduced herself to Mahito. She's like, here, touch my stomach. I have a kid inside me. Okay, so this is where I want to, like, translation differences. Right off the bat, she just t says to this kid, before, like, the belly thing, she's like, I'm your new mom. Touch my belly. Yeah. Does she, that's no. like, I, mean, that's basically does, like, I don't know is. if that's what they say, like, because, like, they just go on and say, like, I'm your new mom. And they just, it was like, what the fuck? Yeah. It's basically like, it was like okay, he, you are being very forward. He gets into the cart and she's like, I'm your new mom, mom now. Here, give me your hand. Touch my belly. Your little baby yeah, brother or sister's in here. Your dad plowed me relentlessly to get this thing to happen. Maybe not that last part, but I was just going to say, I'm like, did I misread something? Yeah, Drew, remember we told you, film? you, you watch the UK <laughs> Japanese version, because that's apparently all you get in Canada is the UK Japanese versions. But oh, yeah, Ohio no, mate. like, I just wanted to make sure that like, it was also just like super upfront in the, the subtitled version, because yeah, they, she just literally comes out and is like, I'm your new mom, touch my belly. Yeah. It's just like what the fuck? <laughs> yeah. It was it was a bit weird. But I I think it's if I if I had to translate that whole scene cuz it's it's very awkward from the very beginning with her in Natsuko. But yeah. I'm I'm pretty sure it's more just like how do you act when you're kind of adopting or basically bringing in your sister's son into your life and you're like you're my new baby now. I have a baby in me. <laughs> and then just to think, like, also, it's like you're staring your mom in the face, but it's like, it's also not your mom, but it's yeah. the same face as your mom. Yeah. Yeah. Or very similar. Yeah. There's just there's like a whole whole bunch of weirdness. Throughout there's a the, lot to unpack the first, there. The first, like, 15 minutes in the film were a lot of very awkward moments. But holy shit, the, the, as tragic as the firebombing scene is, the art and the representation or not representation but like the way it was depicted was oh, so yeah. gorgeous i had never seen hayao miyazaki do something like that like I, like that type of art style so i wanted to talk about that but i didn't know if we wanted to go through kind of the let's rest do of it the... okay i mean we no, can, no, no, we no, can let's take it, it in yeah. chunks we can take this this review in chunks because there is a lot to unpack yeah well so let's yeah. start at the beginning and then go past yeah that fire scene was incredible the way it's it's choreographed and how the animation style shifts so drastically and the one thing that stood out to me the most was that when Mahito's running through the crowd to get to the hospital like all the other people have these weird like shadow faces kind of and it's yeah. very jarring it's like but the only thing that's kept very clear is the hospital so you could tell very early on one of the messages being brought out in the boy and the heron which in the Japanese translation, I don't know why they made it the boy and the heron. It's called "How Do You Live." That's the, yeah. That's the literal translation of the film. Um, you, you and can it's tell brought what, up later in the film as yeah, well. Yeah, as when he's reading a book that his mom had had signed for him or wrote a message in for him. Um, oh, I thought the book's title was "How Do You Live." Yeah, the book's title is "How Do You Live," but his okay, mom wrote yeah, a message yeah. in it. Right, right, right. Yeah. All right. Sorry. Continue. The way that they focus on like Mahito running towards the hospital and the hospital and Mahito being the only ones in focus brings about that message of like, this kid is likely going to spend the rest of his life just living for other people. Like he doesn't care about himself. There's like people trying to stop him. He's zooming by. There's fire everywhere. He's getting caught in the flames. Kind of there's a fireman that explodes at one point when he's running by him. I don't know if you guys saw that. Oh yeah. He's like, stop, kid. Yeah. <laughs> Just gets engulfed in flames instantly. And he's still Fire running. Force. Yeah. Like, it was it was really, really well done. And yeah, to, to your point, Frank, there was the first time in, in any of the Ghibli films that I've seen where there was such a dramatic shift in animation style to this 
I don't even know what you would call it. It was, it was very fluid, but extremely jarring with how everyone else in the images were portrayed with like the, they're very shadowy, very like disfigured faces at times too. Like it was very, very yeah. creepy. It almost looked like a, a literal kind of a, a water paint art book come to yeah. life. Yeah. I'm trying to think of like, I don't like know what good the, the style. Yeah. I don't know what the style would be for that, but yeah, it was, incredible it was absolutely incredible and it was one of those things that later on in the movie i had to ask myself multiple times because uh, as we all famously know hayao miyazaki and cgi do not go hand in hand at all ever and yet i had to ask myself was there cgi in this movie because i could not tell at times there were some times that things were so well animated that shouldn't have been so well animated that like it kind of stood out that was like, is this CGI? I can't tell. I mean, one of the instances is later in the movie where they're in the, uh, the birthing chamber, I suppose. Oh yeah. Where the, 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 the like papers are going like around and around that part looked CGI, but I was like, is that, I can't, I can't tell. So I was kind of in the same boat as you, but I saw, a very sneaky production studio that assisted on this film. Would you like to guess which production studio worked on this film? You had all Ooh. the standard ones. You had, <clears throat> obviously, the Ghibli production studio. You had Production IG, which does a lot of stuff with Ghibli. That was going to be where I was going to yeah. say is IG. No. Who, who has very crisp, almost fool you animation style that you can think of? I mean, the one that comes to mind right now, and I know this is probably out of left field, is Gohans. No, it's not Gohans. I think Gohans it... might have worked on it, but no, not the one I was thinking of. Drew, you have a guess? Is... I'm just going to throw it in the field and just be wild. Was it Mappa? It was not Mappa. It no. was Ufotable. Yeah. Oh, damn. Ufotable worked on this, and I could, I like, because I had the same thoughts too. I'm like, wow, there was a lot of scenes that, like, that stand out amongst the rest. Like, just in terms of, again, how, the, not the animation style, but how it's choreographed, how they they fit everything into one scene. It was beautifully yeah. done for a couple of them. The, you know, and the, the few that we've mentioned already. Um, and I, when I was watching through the credits, I saw very sneakily right at the end of, like, production studios worked on this, you photobo, and I was like, ah, well, there's our culprit right there. <laughs> there you go. Yeah, no, I, I thought it was... The only reason I said Gohans is um, I believe they're the ones that worked on The Masterful Cat is Depressed Again today and the other... What was the one? The Girl I Like Forgot Her Glasses in which they've been doing so many brand new things with anime and animation in which they have like those panning camera shifts while a scene is going on and people are moving in the scene that... I was like, you know what? I could totally see this being a kind of Gohan situation where they're trying out new camera work or new, you know, uh, ideas there. But yeah, no, it makes sense that it's ephotable. Yeah. But that that was the reason why I went to Gohan's. Um, but yeah, no, uh, back to the fire scene. I mean, we've already talked about it, but just to kind of put us back into position to where we can continue on. Fire scene, f like as traumatic as it is, is beautiful. It's gorgeous. It's it's phenomenal, but it's like it's haunting, man. Like those to to well, try and put your feet in his shoes of just running down this pathway or running down this main street where everybody's trying to put out fires and just people are you know becoming the fire is just insane. Yeah, and I think the the lingering message and the fact that it ties in perfectly throughout the rest of the film is it's it's so moving that like when he reaches the fire he sees the image of his mom basically being like, you know, um I I can't remember if she says Mahito, you know, I'll see you soon or Mahito come save me. Because there's one scene where she says come save me and it's like more of like a fucking nightmare. <laughs> but yeah, in in the scene, he kind of sees the image of his mom um, drifting away into the flames. And you could tell, like, there are times where there's a lot of throwaway stuff in Miyazaki's films where he'll put something in 
and you're like, oh, this means something, and then it doesn't mean shit later. And I mm-hmm. had that feeling with this where I was like, wow, what a what an incredible start. Can't wait to not have anything come back about this scene for the rest of the movie. But a mind blown ties into the rest of the film later on, and I was like, whoa, he did it. Fuck it, it took him 8,000 <laughs> years, but he finally did it. He, he took one thing and, and made it fucking seamlessly go to other things. Whoa, whoa, whoa. But yeah, <laughs> yeah, I was I was very pleased with with that aspect of it too. Again, I I feel like we're using really poor language to describe the scene, but I mean, yeah, ex- incredibly emotional and incredibly powerful. Um, but overall, like aesthetically wise and message wise, it was very beautiful, and I, I I'm glad that it continued throughout the rest of the film on how, how these, these different elements and different themes and different messages keep kept coming back and back and back. Yeah. And I think, um, I mean, just to kind of continue the conversation, um, after this scene and after the scene of the introduction of the mother, we're brought to the main estate of where he's going to be living. And I think that this is where my first kind of like negative about this film is in which they spend a shit ton of time here. Oh yeah. They spend half the movie just in like the first half of the movie is the fire scene which lasts all of like two minutes three minutes something like that and then you have the introduction of the mother and going to the estate meeting everybody at the estate and that's like almost an hour long and the whole movie is two hours so like they spent a lot of time here where i think they could have cut down because the back half of the movie was so interesting in the world that they built there was so compelling that I wanted more of that and less of the real world that they were in. So to me, that's where this kind of starts my like slightly negative critique of this movie in which we talked about pacing early on that this was well paced. At times it was a bit fast. This to me was a bit slow. They could have gotten rid of at least one or two scenes here or there in this chunk in this first half because that second half is so bewilderingly amazing and it's while this kind of just sitting at home recovering and doing whatever is kind of not it's 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 good i understand why it's there it's you know setting up future plot points it's setting up character development but to me, it 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 lasts. It it, it outstayed its welcome. Well, I they yeah. Go ahead, sorry. Drew. Oh, all right. Um, so I'll agree, but also like disagree. Um, because there are parts where I enjoyed them being at the estate. So like when the heron comes through and zigzags through the the walkway and gets introduced, and they're like, oh, he's he's a ballsy heron. He's like he doesn't do that all the all the time. Um, you get introduced to the like sea of crotchety grannies who are obviously the the housemaids and they're literally fighting each other for canned meat or cigarettes and getting mad at the old men house servants who do have cigarettes. So I enjoy that part, but just him kind of like lollygagging and being like, uh, I hurt myself. It's my own fault. Um, it was weird how they kind of spent so much time on that, like Frank said, but also when he was at his school, we we basically get introduced to his classmates for all of like three seconds. They all turn their nose up at him. He yeah, goes he outside. In a car. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. And then he goes to help them outside. They yell at him. They beat him up. And then he's like, you know what? Fuck this. I'm going to stay home. I'm going to give myself a mild concussion. And like, takes beans a rock with a yeah rock. yeah beans himself with a rock and that blood animation was like again very fluid very impactful very ghibli very yeah but very well done like it was like all right let's put our budget in this uh and then it skips to him recovering meeting a doctor all that stuff but it's that time frame where he's just kind of being lazy at home obviously because he has a concussion um that I didn't understand because if we skipped past all that school stuff and we just have these scenes of him laying around, like couldn't we skip that too? Magically average. 
I I'm, I'm going to disagree with you both because you oh. guys got little pea brains. You don't understand the true, the bigger picture of it all. Um, no, I said that it's it it develops characters and it like sets things up for the plot, which I understand. But I just it overstated its welcome. What time period are we in? The forties. What happened in the forties? World War Two. World War Two. Any Miyazaki film that happens during the war, he spends a very long time. Normally, I will grant you, normally it's over the course of the film, but he 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 spends a very, very long time really setting the tone for the period in which the movie's de- being depicted. Like the scene where they're all clamoring over the, the canned foods, that's to signify the ration shortages that were rampant throughout Japan during that time period during the war. Like you did, you couldn't find canned food. Like cigarettes were hard. Like any sort of goods were very difficult to come by. So the fact that again, he like the dad is like showing off showboating, not a good seat, not a good look, not during the war. You should be uh, very humble and, and appreciative of what you have and not showboat. Like, you know, drive your kid to school in a car when most other people have never even seen a car. Like, all of that stuff was just to set the tone for the time period. I will grant you that there were scenes at the house that were a little bit slow, but in my opinion, I thought they were quite methodical in how they were laid out. Like, again, elements that were brought back later, him beating himself in the head with the rock in the recovery period and seeing the heron, that was sort of a mind trip to be like, is this shit actually happening? Like, do we know if this is real? Because we kept hearing from the grannies like, oh, we don't hear the voice that you're hearing from the heron. Or, you know, we don't, we don't even see the heron at times. Like, we don't the know what you're talking master. about. Yeah. Or the tower master, too. Like, there's a lot of weird sequences of events after he bludgeons himself with the rock where you start to question yourself as the viewer. Like, okay, is this all just in his mind? Like, is it a dream? Is it? He's hallucinating. Like, what's going on here? Because we're not getting—we're getting conflicting reports from people, right? And that even starts before he beats himself in the head with a rock. Yeah, I yeah, mean, yeah. When but... he first gets to the estate, he goes to what would eventually be the tower, or the main focal point of the film, and he finds like bird feathers inside the tower, and he's picking up these bird feathers. And as soon as like everybody's coming to look for him, he leaves the tower, and he's like, "Where'd the bird feathers go?" Yeah. Like, yeah, you start to wonder, like, what is real, what isn't real. That was, yeah, so part of that sequence at the estate was to, again, set the tone for the time period, but to also establish this weird, conflicting message about, okay, are we actually seeing what Mahito's seeing, or are we seeing visions of what Mahito's seeing? Like, what is real, what isn't real? Um and then it's heightened again by the the next the one scene where he keeps hearing the heron say like you know Mahito come save me I'm your mom Mahito come save me and it's like that's scary uh, I don't know if you guys have ever seen the movie Annihilation nope. uh, there's a fucking fantastic yet I gave myself chills thinking about it creepy ass scene where basically there's a creature that acts like a mimic and can only repeat no. the words of the final thing that the person it ate said, which is their friend saying, help me, save me. Please, God, sounds help like me. The, sounds like the creature from Made in Abyss. It is terrifying. It is one of the scariest fil- scenes I've ever seen in a film. I was so disturbed by it. But that was basically what was happening with Mahito and the Heron, is he's, like, got this really, really raspy, like, unreal unworldly type voice saying like mahito save me and it's like jesus christ not Which, fun in english that that was fucking terrifying yeah i can imagine that's the it only was good robert thing. robert patton's only good thing that wonderful sh- that shiny flamboyant vampire can do right is i guess voices um, he, he did a wonderful job. Like I didn't legitimately did not realize it was him again until like the end of the movie. That's that. See, that's my same opinion about Vin Diesel as Groot. I was like, whoa, Vin Diesel was Groot. Best acting job he's ever done. Anyway, uh, as the scenes go on again, there's more points where he like Mahito goes out to fight him with his sword stick, like and the heron like breaks it. And then he passes out. The grannies find him. He goes back to look at his stick that was shattered. It's in whole. 
He grabs it and then it falls apart. So there's all these like really weird sequences where you're like, okay, what is actually happening? Yeah, what path are we on? Yeah, and then it all culminates to when, again, he was doing this on his own and getting nowhere. But the moment that he's like, Natsuko goes missing, he's like, I'll go find her. I know where she went. She went into the forest. Suddenly, he stumbles upon the entryway into the tower, and that's when he gets to go to the other world. Because he's not doing it for himself. He's doing it for someone else. Hmm? 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 Maybe, uh, maybe, maybe drawing back to that beginning scene with the uh, fire, where you're you're running towards it not for you but for someone else. Hmm. Hmm. Yeah. So. Um, no, I thought I thought it was really well done. I, I, the movie's two hours long. It's over, a little bit over two hours long. I'm fine if you take your time to set up things, to then go into in a well established second act. I will say. Right. I just wish that they had uh, explained a few things in the second act about that world a little bit more. Like, uh, I mean, just to kind of hop into the second act, unless, Drew, you have something to say about the first act. Uh, well, no, just that, like, you're... Magically Average is right. It's because he starts helping um, to look for her. And um, what's Never her name? One of one of ego. one of the one of the housemaids starts helping. To uh, Kiriko, is that her name? Yeah, yeah, yeah. the old one who and like then, smokes. Yeah, and they they kind of stumble old. upon and on the on the house, and then it's a whole bunch of like ghosts and mirrors and like Wizard of Oz stuff to just mess with him to get him to kind of accept that he has to start that journey in the second act. Yeah. But I mean, in the second act, I mean, when he does enter the tower and all the weird fantastical things start happening, like oh, I yeah. wish they would explain the feathers a bit more. Like they, they, the heron drops a feather that he had picked up earlier and legitimately picked up and had, and he attaches it to like an arrow and shoots the arrow and the arrow just like follows the heron around until it finally strikes I wish they would have explained a bit more of that because it seemed like this heron had magical properties of the sort other than that feather because that was feather number seven. And I just wish that they would have maybe explored that a little bit more, but they kind of just leave it at that. I, yeah, I think the only thing I can take from that is that number seven is typically a lucky number in most cultures. Right. So I, well, I just associated that with it's, it's lucky number seven. It's the only way he can fly or whatever. Um, but I, I'm going to, I know I'm going to contradict myself compared to other films. I don't mind that they didn't go into the heron so much or like different characters, because I think it, it established early on that they're not the important focal points that you're not, you're not really supposed to be focusing on like specific characters. You're really Which supposed to be focusing on the journey. Why why did they fucking name this the boy and the heron and not just how do you live? I don't know. So that we could talk about this later. I, I want to talk about <laughs> one other piece um <laughs> to what you were describing with the heron. I I would have thought that they would have explored more about why there's a giant gross man inside a heron suit. Or is it? Yeah. Or or is he is he actually a heron that can manifest himself as a human? Who knows? But regardless, he is a very disturbing character. I didn't like him from the start. The one, the moment where they're still at the estate and the heron opens his mouth, and I see human teeth, I was like, ha ha ha! No, I hate you. Go away. This is not fun anymore. I'm not having a good time. But I I think. The, that was a big piece to it because the, and I should say, I should extrapolate on that. The big piece of, of it not being focused on characters, but more, more or less about the journey and experience and then the message behind it all. Because there's a lot of elements in the second act that they do nothing to explain. Why are there a bunch of pelicans attacking him? They, they kind of explain like, oh, the, the sea was, the, when the one pelican's dying later on, on the ship, uh, and Mahito goes out, and he's like, I'm about to beat your brains in, kid. Uh, 
the pelican's like, well, we didn't have any food. The seas were tainted in our other world, so we had to come here and we eat the Wara Wara. Which, by the way, if I don't see a fucking Wara Wara plushie or shirts with Wara Wara on it or anything right. related to what, yeah, oh yeah, no, yeah, yeah, I'm going to, I'll be in Japan in July. I will go there and and pick it outside of the Ghibli Museum until they I see Wara Wara stuff. Uh, for all of you who haven't seen the film, if you're in this far, don't know what you're doing. But the Wara Wara are these cute little marshmallow fucks that just jump around <laughs> and, and are adorable. And then, when, and then when they come of age, they decide to fly up into the world. They're basically unborn babies. Yeah, that's they're what they, that's, they described. Yeah. They're, they're the souls of unborn babies. And then when they fly up and when they uh, mature, they fly up into the sky and they're born. Souls, souls is a good way to describe it. I thought of something else that starts with an S, but I'm not going to say it. Um, Sweet. Uh, no, no, <laughs> no. I, the, where do, uh, when a mother and a father, when, when the uh, birds meet the... Oh. <laughs> yeah. Sexy anyway. Time. Yeah. Um, oh, yeah. No. There they, you go. Right. But, yeah. um, but no, so like it's, they don't go into detail about the pelicans. Like, again, the pelican explains why they're there, but there's no real like explanation as to like what they mean to this world other than like we just had to escape ours to find food the same thing with the parakeets it's like why are they parakeets is there a deeper meaning behind them nothing is just discussed about the parakeets <laughs> they're just big googly eyed dumbasses that are hilarious and out for blood which I now will only look at parakeets differently. Every time I go to Petco now, I'm going to have my eyes watch, I'm back in my head watching out for those parakeets. So I think when they, when they initially kind of neglected to go deeper into some of the characters and their, their backstories or the, the meaning behind them, I kind of took that as, okay, we're not going to, dive deep into a lot of the character elements throughout the movie. We're not going to get be deep into like develop developing these backstories or any of the lore behind some of these characters or groups of characters. We'll say too with uh, the Pelicans and the parakeets. So when those scenes came up, I kind of just focused on everything besides them. I focused on all of the scenes like going through the journey them infiltrating the castle and the meaning behind the delivery room scene with Natsuko, like I, less about the characters until at the very end, my wife was like, what the fuck was up with the parakeets? And I was like, I don't know, bro. They did. <laughs> was like, well, I they, they almost depicted like the parakeets as if they were like rabbits, like, cause they're like, Oh, the parakeets have invaded the, the blacksmith's house and they ate. And them. then all of a sudden the parakeets were fucking everywhere. Like they were rabbits. Yeah. Yeah, the only the the only thing I could surmise because I was trying to relate it to World War II, I was trying to relate it to other things that that involve parakeets is that in in a while back I don't think that's done anymore because I think PETA would get involved at this point. Um, parakeets were used to determine if there was carbon monoxide in caves when when there were people going into coal mines and that's doing. A canary. Is it canaries? I thought it was parakeets too. I'm pretty sure it was canaries because there's the saying, um, "fucking canary." Oh god damn it! Don't, I don't fuck a canary. What the That's is. not a saying. That do not do that, people. Do not listen to Frank. It, do not fuck a canary. Um, but regardless, like that, that, when she asked me that question, I was like, I have no idea because my brain was so honed in on on everything besides. Like the the meanings behind the characters or the characters themselves, I was just focused on everything that was happening with the journey and what was going on uh, with like the grand uncle and the time doors and things like that. It was it, focused. So it was canary. It's called canaries. Uh, the saying is canary in a coal mine, and you're right. It is. They sent canaries down to the coal mines to uh, look for, basically look for dangerous gases so that humans don't die. Yeah, I knew so it was... If it comes back, you're good. If they don't, don't go down. Yeah, I knew it was a, as a smaller bird that they used. I couldn't remember if it was a parakeet or not. But again, like, goes to my point, though. Do we know anything more about the parakeets? It, at least in from the movie and what was told with us in the movie, I could not surmise anything. Same with the pelicans. Uh, it, there, there was just a lot of... Like, like even uh, the scene 
and I, I apologize, I'm still rambling. The scene with uh, the fisherman woman, well, and we'll just say it's Kiriko for it doesn't matter because everyone. Yeah, I was going to say, everyone who's watching by now, we've already told you spoilers, and if you haven't seen this far, you're probably so confused. But with Kiriko and Mahito, when, like, they, Kiriko just starts bossing him around, it's like, get on the ship, turn the hoi, the, 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 fl- the, that way, the, land ho, like, get this fish. And the fish Don't is be like, useless. <laughs> yeah, the fish is like 50 feet long. And then she's like, all right, we caught the fish, cut it up, stop spilling guts. God, you're useless. But, um, yeah, when she's, when he, Mahito points out all of these um, different boats with kind of faceless figures on them. They're all the same. And mm-hmm. he's like, okay, well, what are they doing? And she's like, uh, duh, they're coming to get the meat from the fish because they can't kill. And I'm like, okay. And then they just leave well, it at that. And that yeah. was it. That was it. And then they're like, oh, BT Dubs, Wara Wara. And I was like, woo, Wara Wara. Yeah, <laughs> nothing else matters anymore. Do I care about what they just went through? No, Wara Wara. They're the Princess Mononoke guys of this movie. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. And then you get the one fucking pelican who's about to die, and it's just Willem Dafoe giving him monologue, and it's like, holy shit. (laughs) Yeah. So, yeah, a lot of that I just kind of threw out the window when it came to characters and stuff. Because I, it, that was the one piece to it of the Miyazaki, um, I guess. I don't want to call it a curse, but like the, the the staple Miyazaki elements of bring something up that seems interesting, but never explain it and never go back to it. Which yeah, I'm fine like if him. it's the characters. If I'm fine if it's these side characters or these like characters that uh, that we're not going to see much anymore. Okay, so long as we get those impactful scenes from and messages back that involve the journey and the experience, like we do with the initial fire scene and, and a couple scenes later on. I mean, for me, the the one point of intrigue that we never revisit again, and I wish got a little bit more explanation or came back near the end, was the gate to the graveyard. It was just this big golden, like, gate in between just a tiny, like, little short stone, like, pathway that could have easily been hopped. But no, the the everybody went through the gate rather than just over the small teeny tiny wall which i thought was interesting and then kiriko comes to land and is like ah shit the gate to the graveyard is open again and it's like hey don't look in the fucking like stone hole thing like they'll they'll come after you they'll kill you and i was like what will what's gonna kill me i want to know this this is interesting and then they never fucking like they never talk about it again no they're like hey yeah, yeah. no don't don't like, don't lose eye contact with it, back up, come to the sands, and then bow, and then you're good. But it's just like, why? Why, why do we have to do any of this? I want to know. So, so, And it just never comes back again. Go for it, Drew. So I believe the alternate world that they're in is, like, the the rift between, like, life and death. So, like, to me, that is, if you cross over and you go through that gate... You're going to the afterlife. You're like, you're willingly saying like, I'm done. Here's where I'm resting. Because she even says in the Japanese version that like, don't wake the dead. Don't pay them any attention or they'll come and get you. So my, my whole understanding was basically if Mahito kept walking towards it, he would have just died. Like he's just succumbing to whatever. And so she's kind of, and I know this is extrapolating a lot. She's kind of like the angel that comes through, pulls the wayward sword, uh, soul out of it and pulls them back away from it to say like, no, no, no. Like that's where the dead are. So then my, my question is, or I, again, this is me trying to remember a full two hour movie (laughs) with everything. Um, I don't remember if she says that you'll wake the dead or if she said you'll wake them. Because I don't remember if she gives it a specific adjective or not, um, because or noun or whatever you want to call it. Uh, because yeah, I, I was very not confused. Like I understood that it was a graveyard, and it probably that that was like the abyss mm-hmm. of death. But why then the pelicans? Like why are the pelicans so hell bent on getting past this gate? And I know yeah. that that's why you're saying I wish they would have explained pelicans a bit more. I agree. I also wish that like with this whole movie having a lot of themes about birth and children and babies. I wish those pelicans were storks instead. 
I, I think oh. that simple change could have been so much more impactful for the fact that, um, I mean, storks are usually meant to bring babies. So that's when, you know, your kid is too young and they ask how, where did, you know, little sister come from? It's like, oh, the stork dropped him off. Like, that's that's it. Um, so I, I wish that they had maybe had done that one slight change. It wouldn't have made sense with the Warawara being the souls of babies and then the pelicans destroying the Warawara. But at the same time, it could have been twisted to where it's like, oh no, the, the storks are grabbing the Warawara to be born and then the ones that are left over didn't make it. Instead of like the pelicans are destroying them. I don't know. It, it's just... There's a lot that could have been tweaked, I think, to make it a little bit better, but there's also just, like, some things that could have been explained a little bit better, in my opinion, there. But I think that whole, uh, this whole transition scene into the, the, not necessarily afterlife, but, like, uh, what, fuck, what's the place between? Purgatory? Limbo. Or, yeah, purgatory, limbo. I think that this transition was really good, um just needs a little bit more explaining and then we kind of get into the back half of the film after the whole Wara Wara scene and Willem Dafoe making a monologue <laughs> and uh they go into you know trying to find the blacksmith and it's like okay cool like you and the gray heron you guys go have fun on your adventure you need to make up and be friends so that way you can get back to your real world yeah and that also was like confusing is like why did they need to like make up and become friends again like is that like so that he could patch the hole that he made in the the heron's beak and like they can become friends again and they can escape together because that hole in his beak meant that he could not fly anymore and i think that that whole scene where he does repair the beak was hilarious yeah i laughed at that that was in my opinion that was one of the funniest scenes it's just like, cool, you repaired me? Fuck you, kid, I'm out of here. Ha ha ha, oh fuck, no, I'm not out of here. Can you repair it? Can you no, he it down a little bit more here? No, he was about to leave, and he's like, uh, oh, man, this part's really annoying underneath on the upper side of my mouth. Can you just, like, help? And then he's like, can you make it smooth, please? I just, and he's like, shut up! Yeah. Um. So, yeah, real quick to uh, go into a little bit about the gate, I believe and i'm sure people will correct me if i'm if i'm wildly inaccurate um but the with the purgatory and kiriko being the fisherman i and everyone else being souls i believe she is effectively supposed to portray um the river man on the river of sticks that oh, okay the yep. dead the, lead the dead uh from the real world into uh the afterlife which is Grecian or Roman, I can't remember. Um, but that gate, I believe, is supposed to be uh, like the gate into the afterlife, and the tomb is supposed to symbolize another element to one of the Grecian or Roman uh, pieces of afterlife. I can't remember what it is. I I, I remember reading about it when I was in school, um, and it was a huge part of like uh, the Grecian or Roman gods pieces. But anyway. Uh, I, that's what that whole scene is. It's like purgatory. She's on the river of sticks. That's why there's all a bunch of souls just wandering around and they can't do anything for themselves. And she's has to like basically help them. And that's why the war war are there because they actually ascend into life from this realm of non living things, basically. Um, and it, so that was that whole piece. I do agree though. I think they could have gone into a little bit more detail, but I want to make a very, very clear point to us and everyone listening, this movie is based off of an already existing tale. This is not a new story right. by Miyazaki. This is an existing tale. How do you live? Is is was originally a novel or originally a, a folk tale, I believe, that was told in Japanese culture like very long ago. So we're gonna get a lot of weird pieces that aren't extrapolated a lot because. I think one, it was brought towards this time period still. Granted, I mean, it's still depicted from World War II, but it's bringing it forward into the 21st century, which some elements are probably lost in translation today. Uh, and two, you have to make an entertaining movie out of it. And I feel like there were some pieces that 
Miyazaki wanted to keep in because it it you know you got to keep true to the story and the tale and how everything is is brought forward uh, in the novel, but at the same time you still have to make it fluid and entertaining. And I think that's where we get these weird pieces of like, what did the crypt mean? Who knows? Why are there pelicans and parakeets? Who knows? Like the the whole there's a quick sequence. And as we get further on now, um, where we, we finally kind of uncover the tower and, and its origins and the power that it holds. And it was a rock that came from outer space. Yay, like, aliens. Yeah, like it's like, like I, okay, cool. And it's like, BT Dubs, your, grand, your great grand uncle went in there and just fucking went loony bins. Uh, and that's all we know. And it's like, whoa, okay. It'd be really cool if we went deeper into that. Um, nope. I mean, <laughs> basically, yeah. But, it, but I, I, it, I think a lot of the issues that came about from this film, granted, I still really enjoyed it. I, I, I do think it's in my top five easily for me as, for Ghibli films, um, but I, I think some of the shortcomings and in, in some of the pieces that people are going to uh, pick about a lot, which I, I would as well, is that you still have to piecemeal a lot of these different parts together. Like with the tower, with the granduncle, with, with everything about the lineage. They keep talking about like, you know, oh, I need an heir, the granduncle, who's basically like, I mean, let's just call it what it is. He's like a time wizard effectively yeah uh he's made really... a bunch of doors to like different yeah. time periods he, of his life and his ancestors lives he is the one that keeps the world this this world in balance and this world is what connects all these different timelines together um now are they just timelines of his ancestors and his lineage or is it the timelines of every conceivable universe in the world who knows? I'm thinking the former because the latter would be insane, but, you know, whatever. Um, he's going to need a bigger tower. He's going to need a lot more blocks is what I can yeah. tell you. Well, uh, that was also like a thing that they like explained but didn't explain very well was the blocks. So like he, he they they show that this man is like has a bunch of building blocks that are all built up into a tower and they're balanced, which they look like they should not be balanced and he would like flick it every once in a while and if it remained it was good and then every three days he would have to rebuild this tower for this world to survive but then he's like well the tower's about to fall we got one day left it's like so like why why is it now that you know when the tower falls like it's over but you, he can't just rebuild it himself and he I... needs an heir to rebuild it I, I'll answer that before we circle back to the bigger pieces right, too. Because I we think, are skipping a lot here. <laughs> I I think the the building box scene where he he requests Mahito to build it is to just test to see if if what he builds is what Mahito truly desires. Because again, as I've said from the beginning. There are messages imbued in everything that in this movie. And, and the big message at the very end, again, tied to the title, How Do You Live, is effectively, do you want to create the perfect world for you or do you want to create a world for everyone? Right? And that's what that's the whole scene with Mahito and the Parakeet King. Because his granduncle is like, all right, start building. And Mahito's like, there's so much malice in these blocks. I cannot. There's like so much hatred in my heart for everything I've gone through that if I build something, it's going to come out in whatever world I build. And his granduncle's like, hey, good on you for noticing that. I'm going to go find some other ones. I'm going to fucking traverse the, the universes, go through space and time, and I'm going to get you some new building blocks. Don't you worry your pretty little head. Uh, I'll be right back. And then there's a whole scene with the, the in the kingdom, the parakeet kingdom, um, and Himmy and Natsuko with the delivery room, which I'll, I'm going to go circle back to that in a second. And then at the very end, 
He's like, all right, I got you brand new building blocks. I need you to be the next heir because only my descendants, only people in my lineage can take over this role of, of maintaining the balance of this world. And you can build it in however manner you want. And that's when Mahito goes, nope, I don't want to because regardless, I'm going to build a world for me and not for everyone. And then the Parakeet King is like, fuck you. I'm coming in. I'm going to build a world to keep the parakeets alive. And what happens? The world crumbles. So this is where we have our, like, where we can talk about a translation difference. So for uh, for me, for the dub, he doesn't say, I, I want to build a world for me. He's like, I don't want to touch these blocks because I still have, like, I'm tainted. I have malice in me. That's that's that, effectively what I was, he didn't right. say, I'm building a world for me. But yes, the, the, the but, message yeah, comes he, out as like, you can't build a world for yourself. No one can have control over over the the sequence of events that happens in time, and you can't create this perfect world in your vision because you're always going to have bias. You're always going to have feelings and emotions that are going to affect things. Let me finish. So he says, like, I have malice in me. I don't want to infect these blocks that do not have malice in them. Not necessarily I want to build a world for myself. He's saying, I don't want to touch these blocks because these blocks are untainted. I want them to remain untainted. And then the Parakeet King is like, if you're not going to build like the world to save this world, I will. And then he builds the thing up, it falls, and then everything crumbles. But the Parakeet... So they're, they're... What? I was going to say, the Parakeet King builds it with the intention of keeping the Parakeet... Right. The... Just everybody alive, essentially. No, not everyone. For the benefit of the Parakeets. The whole, the whole piece of the, the, the reason why they bring up the Parakeet King and that whole speech where he's like, I'm going to go to the Time Wizard and I'm going to tell him that he needs to support us, that this is for our benefit, that there was a tran- transgressor that went into the delivery room. We're going to use that for our, for as, as bargaining yeah. power they and we're going to go rules. and we're going to make a world for us. That was what came out. I, yes. Mahito says he doesn't want to touch these blocks because he has malice and he would taint them. But again, the larger message from this, as tied back to the beginning, is you can't create a world for yourself. You can't. Cre- no one has control over the sequence of events that happens. And even if you do, you're going to fuck up everyone else. If you try to make a perfect world for you that only benefits you, that only supports you... You're going to have bias. You're going to have emotions like malice and hatred and all these other very strong pieces come out in your world. And yeah, you might be happy at the end, but that doesn't mean that you've created the perfect world. The perfect world is something that you don't have. No one has control over that. Everything has to play out as the universe foretells. And that's effectively what the message was from the beginning. Is like yeah, that yeah. you have to no, 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 live no. for others and not just yourself, right? Because the grand, yeah, the great uncle is like he, because Mahito's like, I want to go back to my world, and he's grand uncle's like, you want to go back to a world with death and thievery and and rampant like destruction, and he's like, well, it's my world, it's what I live in, I have no control over that, I have to live the best of my life. How do you live? <laughs> like, <laughs> finally, we get all these different tie-ins, except the bum, ba-dum, fucking title is The Boy and the Heron in English. Yeah, that still makes no sense. Yeah. But I, I like, I, I really, really, I think this is where I, my, my opinion of the movie, sh- like, really went up. Because um, I was very pleased with it as, as we were going through the different acts, but I think the very end is where I was, I was extremely f- f- pleased with, with, how well the messages came out because it was this is one of the few Miyazaki films I think I said this at the beginning too where the message was very very clear like it was it was established from the beginning it was slowly kind of built throughout and it was brought out at the very end as like a you can't miss this for the love of God you you, please don't miss this message and I think they did it in a really really good manner too because it wasn't, it wasn't like it was just plastered on the screen. Like it didn't come up with like, how do you live, <laughs> right? <laughs> it, it it was just it was well thought out and and well uh, articulated in in the dialogue between the uncle Mahito and Himi. Um, 
and and then obviously the sequence with the parakeet king and how every uh, how the world crumbles right like right. i i thoroughly enjoyed that piece again the message was what i got out of it all what happened afterwards with the tower falling and birds shitting everywhere and yeah. everyone just having a happy hunky hoary day and then 2 years pass and then the the movie ends that was a little frustrating. Yeah. <laughs> that was a little frustrating, but at least at least you got the message out and at least it was it was very clear and very pointed. I just love that old Kiriko pops out of his pocket at the very end and it's just like Well, it's the, it's, he had the doll. No, I know, he had the doll, yeah. but like in it just was exo facto kind of really funny that it's just like the doll just transforms back into human form and it's just like oh i'm here i'm not going to question anything goodbye yeah. <laughs> and, and we're we're i realize we're quickly approaching an hour for this and we could talk about this for another yes. hour more because there's a lot to it but the one because we haven't talked about like the general tropes that miyazaki puts in all of his movies we haven't talked about the music which is great That's, and, we'll talk like... about the music last because i know you guys have very strong opinions on it the one piece i want to bring up in the ending sequence that i thought we were going to get some sort of weird inception ending was that not only does Mahito bring back the doll of Kiriko, but he also brings back a block. And I thought he was going to yep. like go into his pocket two years later and be like, huh, and then the movie would end? Like, nope. does the top stop <laughs> spinning or does it keep spinning on? Is he actually yeah. in the dream world? Like, I thought they were going to do that, but they didn't. They well, were just like, two years passed and we're going back home. Bye. So, yeah, in, in our, I don't know if it was different in yours or not, but they, they kind of explained that the block and the doll is what helps him remember that world because usually when you leave that world, you forget everything about it. And the, the Heron kind of explains to him like, Oh, you'll forget in time. So yeah, you could have done an inception thing where he pulls the block. And I was like, why do I have this block? What is this block? And he forgets like his whole adventure, but they opted not to go down that route. Drew, you've been very quiet during this whole, like, I know. Of plot. <laughs> I'm sorry. I just, uh, no, no, no. It was I didn't want to interject because you guys are on awesome trains of thought. And usually that's my my job is to derail those trains. But um, the the ending sequence leading up to like the life lesson and building your own world and parakeets shitting everywhere. Um, uh, it was one of the better points of the movie, even though we didn't talk about Hime and how she's a firebender and stuff like that. And that's never explained. Let's go um, into it. I honestly, this movie has so much just built into it. Let's make this a long episode because I, I, I want to sure. talk about it more. So let's let's do it. All right. So back all the way back to when he gets saved and they're fishing and they we see the wire wire. Um, there's just this mystical flame princess that we just assume is like this guardian of of the way everything is, and she's shooting fire and she's killing these pelicans there is absolutely no explanation one who or what she is at that point um how she got her flame powers or or why she does this except to like just protect the the wire wire so though the one thing i i harp on miyazaki every once in a while is that he drops the ball on explaining key elements and just leaving them for your own interpretation but then coming back to them later. So he at least in this one kept that process actually like part of his fundamental design where he's like, here's something you might need it later. And then he came back to it and go, here it is. Here it is later. And he's he's done it a couple of times, but uh, where he just kind of leaves stuff and he's like, well, I storyboarded this. This is what it is. And it, it happens. But I found he had a better concise plan or even outline for this movie this time because it was based on something else it wasn't something he completely storyboarded in the middle of the night on 32 cups of coffee it was anchored in a in a predetermined world that had a lot of information and that we through cookie crumbs start learning more we can put our own things together with saying yes this is the river of sticks or this is the world between life and death, things like that. And then when we do get our our big parts at the end where whether it's Mahito being like, no, I, I can't create a world, I'm broken. Or even just the, the end sequence where 
everyone's happy and we're treated to like just beautiful landscapes. Like the one thing I wanted to touch on earlier where you were saying about CGI and animation was Mahito, when he first starts exploring, he's running through like this grassland area and it's almost as if the grass itself is a completely separate entity from how he's animated. So it's, it's like almost like a, a pastel kind of chalky design versus like his very solid animation cell. And it just kind of makes everything more lush, more authentic is what I want to call it. And then it just, the world feels real. It feels lived in. And that's a, a gripe I've had before where things are too clean, not um, set up to be like, well, like there's dirty laundry, there's, dents and cracks in the home or when we explore the castle there's pieces missing so all of this to say i did very much enjoy the film but my my only real gripe is that solid hard end where you're expecting a little more and what i wanted to also comment on that is there was a family behind me so when that when it ended and we get introduced to the credits this the family of six behind me went huh <laughs> just very audibly and the whole theater cracked up in laughter <laughs> yeah this this family's probably expecting something along the lines exactly. of like a light-hearted tale like spirited away or my Kiki's <laughs> delivery service instead they get this two-hour fucking time piece period drama of a boy who is going through depression and how to work his feelings out yeah, yeah and going through grief right yeah. yeah, but you brought up a good point of, like, this is based on something. This isn't actually the first time, though, that he's made a movie based off of something else. Like, famously, Howl's Moving Castle is loosely based off another novel. Um, and I kind of looked through his discography, and Kiki's Delivery Service and Porco Rosso are also based off of other things. I mean, Porco Rosso being based off a of manga kind of a similar title that he made already but it, it isn't the first time that he's you know actually like made a film based off another property well i mean and it's not even a real other property but the wind rises it's a true story about a about an actual person yep in world war ii so you know you have that piece to it as well where it's you're you're Again, you have creative elements to the movie to make it entertaining, but you're you're following effectively the the story of a person who designed airplanes, specifically right. fighter planes in World War II. So, yeah, I mean, you, with with a lot of the Miyazaki films, if they if, you know when they do come from other sources and stuff, there's limitations, but you can see the creative pieces as well in what he brings out, and that's I think where you hit those points of having to to pick up the breadcrumbs, right? The yeah. the one piece that to to kind of contradict what you were saying, Drew, uh with Himmy, uh, the or better known in your terms as the firebender, um <laughs> is I I actually liked how they kept her quite mysterious for the first couple of scenes with her. Um because again, like we don't know this the the fisher person, right? We don't know why in the Fisher person's house they have the dolls of the grannies, right? And eventually Mahito connects the dots and realizes there's one missing, and the one missing is Kiriko, and just kind of throws out, you don't happen to be Kiriko, do you? And she's like, how the fuck do you know my name? And he's <laughs> like, I don't know, but you're Kiriko. Well, you yeah, basically. Um but you see the scene where where Hemi is trying to save the Warawara by by shooting up big fireworks to kill the pelicans, albeit kind of burns up a couple of Warawara too. Um, which I thought my wife was gonna cry. No, she didn't. She cried in a trailer leading up to the movie, but not anything in the movie. So we're gonna skip by that though. Um, and then. Kiriko, well, Mahito's yelling at her, and Kiriko's like, no, 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 she's doing good. She's saving the Warawara. Like, it it just, that's kind of how it has to go. Like, you have to drive the Pelicans damage. away. Right. Uh, and then she's like, thanks again. And you could tell, like, there was a connection between this Fisher person and Himmy. 
And then we learn that the first person's Kiriko. And then Mahito finally meets Himi. And you're like, ha, it's weird that this person is using fire and we see her in a scene where she's in these balls of flames and just her face is out. I feel like I've seen that at some point in this movie, huh? And then... Dun, dun, dun. So, so this is yeah. where I, like, after your next sentence, I want to see if it's similar or different in the translation. So oh. Continue with um, your statement. Well, we really don't... I th- I'm trying to remember. So they, she takes her back to his place. He's eating with her. And then she's like, all right, we got to get inside the, the castle. And you still don't really know who the person is all that much until they're like, okay, we have to go find Natsuko. She's in the delivery room. And you get this sequence of events with Mahito and Natsuko where Natsuko's like, get the fuck out. And Mahito's like, oh, Why? And then a bunch of paper things come out and not, uh, Himi explodes them and then has this speech about how Natsuko's her little sister. And you're like, oh, okay, yeah. all right. But I, I like how it was – She they kept her mysterious. Like they, they kept you kind of guessing as to who this person was. Again, could definitely come to conclusions before the big reveal – uh, with with how she is depicted in the fire um, and kind of her actions and how I think they make a comment about how she looks similar to someone else, which was, again, a comment from one of the grannies at the beginning scenes where they're like, wow, she really does look like uh, Mahito's mother. Like, it's crazy. Um, but with all that said, the one scene that did kind of make me pissed <laughs> is that at the very end, when the, when time is collapsing, the world is crumbling around them, and they're finally about to make it to their door back to their reality. Himi hugs Mahito and goes, I cannot wait to be your mother. You are such a good boy. Deuces. And I'm like, <laughs> was that necessary? Come on. Come on. I can't wait to be your mother for all of eight years. Basically, yeah. Um. That's that scene also was was a little bit. Uh, I, I mean, I enjoyed it, but I, I I find time travel and 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 just how time is portrayed in, in many anime to be very frustrating because the the implication is that when Himi, Mahito's mom, when she was younger, which we find out this in a story from one of the grannies, who's telling it to Mahito's dad even. We get a scene with like <laughs> Mahito's dad being like, what the fuck is going on? How do you have three missing people at once? And all the grannies are like, spooky things happen around here. <laughs> the, this, things. And he's like, really? Is this the time for a ghost story? And the one fucking fish-eyed granny comes out and she's like, I see everything. Um, <laughs> but they say Those like... grannies were fucking weird. I dude. love the grannies. They were they wild. They were funny, but they were like fucking like rats on cheese. <laughs> they were they were absolutely wild. But they they tell a story about how Mahito's mom when she was younger had gone missing for a year. A year and came back and was the yep. s- looked the same as she was before. And came back like nothing happened. But no memory of where she was and you're like, "Okay, all right. I'm I'm seeing everything kind of come together." So, but the the that imp- the implication of that scene coupled with the ending sequence with Mahito and her and then obviously Kiriko and the heron is that they were all in the time castle this this beacon of all time periods and universes colliding at once at the same time simultaneously which means that Hemi would have known that Natsuko was pregnant with Mahito's dad's baby. And Himi also knew somehow that Mahito was going to be her son. Which I mean, wouldn't have if, happened if well, they were in the time castle at the same time. You see what I mean, though? But here's, here's where you can make an argument that she would know. And that is when she dies, her older self dies, she would have to come through the gates to go to the grave. As you guys were saying that that's where all dead souls go. We don't Himmy know that for met. sure. Right. But if we're saying that this is the place between life and death, you would assume that 
in all souls travel through here, new and old, you could make an argument that Himmy met her older self in this little time capsule thing because of when she died. And then she could have gotten the life story from that. But that would imply that Himmy's older self had returned to the River of Sticks and not had just gone to, since she had passed, to the afterlife, right? Never made it into the River of Sticks. Went right through the gates into Death's Chamber. That's the only implication. Because, again, going back to the beginning when they seep through the ground into this other world <laughs> and the fisherwoman's like, where'd you come from, kid? He's like, above. And she's like, ah, classic. Fall, kids falling from the sky every now and again. Same shit, different day. Um, is that they're in the world that does not exist between life and death. They're in, they're in a world where time doesn't pass. They're in this world where it, feasibly all life is created and destroyed at the same time. Right. So with Himmy's mom passing in the fire, she would just have gone to the afterlife. The, the, it, if I were to theorize, she would never have passed through this area. It would effectively it be that she had just gone into the afterlife, never experiencing purgatory. And so would have never met herself, albeit could have, I guess, but. Everything else that played out through these the the movie and in the second act would would imply that she would not have, which is why the time sequence and that all times exist simultaneously piece is a little frustrating when she's like, "I'm your mom. I can't wait to birth you and then die." <laughs> I mean, you could also make the argument that when they are with the great uncle, her knowing that it is the great uncle. And the great uncle saying, hey, uh, you know, great grandson or whatever, like, they, they, you can infer that she can figure it out that way where yeah, it's like, oh, yeah, my, yeah, yeah, aunt, yeah. my aunt is having a, a baby. And it's like, well, I don't have any other sisters. Like, this must be mine. Right. This little fuck here. But um, no, and, and that that part, again, the fact that she's like, I'm your mom. It, it's that's not the issue. The issue is that they they come into. Excuse me. They come into the same part of the time period, like simultaneously. Like all these sequences of events are, are technically happening simultaneously, but she's been in there for a year at this point. So she returns to her time period, the same time that Mahito, Natsuko, and the Heron return to their time period. Right. So it's like it like that piece is really, really weird. They don't really go into detail. And that's I think that's coupled with the whole like not really explaining what this outer space rock tower th contraption really is. And also the flying turd that's next to the grand uncle in multiple scenes where he's like, this is my rock. It's got emotions and it can think, electro electrocute you. I think the stone is what like the, the rock that the uncle is obsessed with is the thing that falls in the, what like there's yeah. like an outer shell to it. And then that is the core of it. And the it, core is what gives him the magical that's, powers to make the a core, world and the, the world shouldn't it. exist. And then, yeah, yeah. <laughs> but like, I think the, the whole thing of like this world exists inside the river sticks or in the afterlife and it shouldn't exist. And that's why it's going to fall. And that's why he needs a successor. Like it's, it's kind of like, you can infer that this is so unnatural to this world that it is actively being worked against by, you know, the gods of time or whatever, um, by the, you know, life and death that they're trying to get rid of this alien thing that came to this world. Yeah. Um, I don't know. I like overall, I enjoyed the movie. I enjoyed the journey. There's just a few things that irked me overall. I thought it was a great movie. I, I enjoyed it. Um, I will admit leaving the movie immediately with, before giving it a lot more thought and discussing it with the friends that I saw it with. I thought that this was kind of tied together with like bubble gum and a shoestring. I was like, what the fuck? And then it's like, okay, no, no, no. Let's, let's critically think about this. Okay. This makes more sense, but it's just like the initial gut reaction. I was just like, what the fuck is this? Like it was my initial gut reaction of when I walked out of the theater 
for A Wind Rises when I was much younger and didn't understand a lot. Yeah. So it, it is one of those things that it is a deeper film and it is harder to judge because it is a work of art more than it is a clear cut. Here's a plot. Here's the bad guy. Here's the not bad guy. Like this is a Ghibli movie, Ghibli Ghibli movie. There is like a shoestring plot that you can follow, but it is more about the journey. Uh, amongst other, I feel like tropes that like Ghibli tropes that are thrown into this, you have the giant headed people, the giant headed people make a return and the grannies that the, the housekeepers, um, you have the strong woman character, which I absolutely love that they always include a strong woman in which you get multiple in this movie. Um, I, I, I love that. You don't really get much of like the planes like uh, Miyazaki loves flight loves planes the only like plane that we get are the parts that they move into the house which also another like interesting kind of World War II uh, era type mindset of hey we gotta store all these plane parts at the house because we don't want the factory to be bombed and lose all this shit so we have to store it here. Like that that piece to me like stood out and I was just like, oh, wow. Okay. Sure. Yeah, this makes sense. Um but that was like the only kind of like airplane-y thing in the movie, other than the fact that you had a shit ton of birds. Like which do take flight. So to me that was one of those like, okay, you can make an argument that the blains the the bird the bird I combine birds and planes and said blanes the blanes um i, I the love that alfred the, hitchcock film yeah <laughs> no, <God. laughs> um but you can make an argument that the birds are the planes of the movie so like you have flight again in this movie um nature's planes yeah and then i mean you also have nature there's nature like nature is prevalent in all ghibli ghibli movies and, and this one is no exception between the estate and the overgrown, um, like the castle, where, or castle tower. warehouse, like side building thing to the world inside this alien rock. Like there's, there's a lot of nature and like scenic moments to be had. So again, a lot of tropes that Ghibli Ghibli loves. They are very present. In the movie. I, I think, don't know. Uh, yeah. No, the one yeah. thing I, thought you guys were going to talk about at this point was going to be the music i was waiting for drew to bring it up i'm not going to be like, i'm not going to have this friend whole podcast. Joe. i'm not going to have this whole podcast episode be you and me talking <laughs> <laughs> we need we uh, need our, no. our buddy to get in here so joe he, he's sasashi he's fantastic and when his music swells like it it has meaning so kind of while we've been talking i've just been going in retrospect to think about the the movie and kind of come at it from a different point of view um it feels like his music was only used for impactful moments it was it wasn't that the score had an underlying like totoro vibe where you always hear totoro or something like just goofing in the background it was it was during times of need um and even at a point where like if we want to go all the way back to the beginning of the film like that fire scene there's no music. It's just the fire. It's the people. It's the clamoring. It's the sense of urgency. And you have that. I don't know if it's in a sound archive or something, but it's that fire swelling noise where it almost sounds like um, like it's escaping from a room or escaping from a device. And it goes, Wah! and it just sounds like it's getting sucked out. Right. And that's like, stop laughing. Anyways. The sound design and the music hand in hand. There's beautiful times where he's looking at the lake and it sounds like he's actually out in a nature preserve just looking at a lake. There's sounds in the background that don't really need to be there, but they are like the house creaking at points when they walk through the old house. Um, even just like uh, one of the old men like taps out his um, tobacco pipe. And the way the metal clink is there, it's just everything that they they focus on in animation, like that same kind of love and care that they devote to making this fume, uh, fume, film look beautiful, 
they also devote to to your ears. So the the score itself, when it does come into play in those very few select times, is beautiful and it is like affects you as a human to be like, wow, like this is exactly what I wanted in a film. This is exactly where I wanted to be. Like this is everything's coming together. It's beautiful. Um, and then there's obviously the the hard stop a couple of times, but I looking back at my experience with the film and originally like when I came out of the theater, I was like, ah, well, like if I was to put a number on this, it'd probably be lower to a seven, but I want to echo to what Frank was saying and kind of, you need to let it cook. You need to let it simmer. You need to digest everything that you've been given in this movie and to come back to it with you all and re rediscover it and talk about it more. Like I'm, I'm closer to a nine now because it hits everything you want in a Ghibli film. It's, it's, uh, it is getting close to being a masterpiece. It's not going to be the most perfect film far from it, but I think out of the, the ones that have come in the last 10 years, it's probably the strongest. Yeah. Yeah. Um, to talk about music real quick. And then a theme that we like, I know we're, we're pressed for time right now. I know Drew, you need to head out of here soon. Um, but Music wise, I, I will say that I think that, yes, this they had impactful moments with the music. I think that this is one of the lesser. Um, I think because they don't have that signature song that this is probably one of the lesser uh, OSTs that they've done. They didn't lean so heavily on music for music's sake. They just put it in when it was needed. But I think that the lack of music at times was also very impactful where it is like when we are living our day-to-day lives, unless you're wearing headphones 24 hours, there are moments in your life that it's just going to be completely dead silent where you do hear the cracks and crank, like creaks of a house. And then, um, but just kind of, to me, it was almost jarring to have those moments of no sound because I was in a theater where they serve you food on top of just like drinks and whatever, like they'll they'll serve you full on meals, and to hear kind of just everybody munching and crunching on whatever they were eating, it was just like, oh please play some fucking music so I don't have to listen to people go nom nom. Like here's your chicken it, tenders, it was, sir. Yeah, no, exactly. It was just like it was one of those things of like, no, please, please play music. I don't want silence right now. I don't want to hear people's gums smacking um but i just real quick because we brought it up before we even talked about like the like before we started recording we never really talked about it again one of the main themes of this being stages of grief like going through the the five stages like the first act denial mahito doesn't say a fucking word until like 20 minutes into the movie like him just kind of like not being in denial of just like oh my god like no this didn't happen my mom like like what is going on and then to him becoming so angry at this heron and then bargaining of him being like going to the river sticks and like the other side um of just i think bargaining of just like okay like maybe if i do this like i can save my mom somehow because i am going to the castle, going to the other side to try and save my mom. Maybe this can happen. And then depression, when his new mom tells him, I don't love you, it's like, I am sad now. Like, no, this is this is all happening. My mom is dead. My new mom doesn't love me, whatever. And then by the end of the film, it is acceptance of where he, I can build my own world, but no, I need to accept where I am, what my life is, et cetera, and move forward. I, I think that that was really really well done and really like it, it is a clear line you can see where he kind of switches from stages in the in in grief so i love that i thought it was fantastic yeah uh, again coming straight out of the theater i'd be right there with you drew i'd say maybe a seven seven and a half but i think after discussing and having my own thoughts to myself about this movie i would put it closer to an eight and a half nine my my only comment about the music is I think, and I know this is probably controversial for g- most Ghibli Ghibli fans out there, but I thought in terms of sound design, soundtrack I'll give you probably a little bit lacking, 
But for sound design, incorporating the soundtrack, all the different sound effects they use and everything like that, I think this is the best movie. Best Ghibli yeah. Ghibli movie for I won't I won't because I won't fight you on that. I I think the OST you will agree on, but yeah, yeah, the sound design was phenomenal. Because there's there's so many layers to it that you can pick out. Like and and maybe I'm going too deep into it, but the the sequence the sequences where there's no music and there's really no sound. It's just like like you said, like a gust of wind blowing by, the the water rushing through uh, you hear some bugs, you hear creaks in the house, you hear all these different like little sounds. They're not like, you know, there's no backing track to it. It it really adds to this uneasiness of the film because Japan's in war right now. I believe at this time period, Japan's also not winning the war. So the fact that the dad's like, BT Dubs, we got to take all these plane parts from the factory because there's a good chance they might just get bombed at any point. The fact that you have a lot of these like si- almost silent scenes is extremely impactful because it's it's that's a rarity in Japan. You start off with the the fire scene, there's chaos, there's horn like the the first scene of the movie is horns going off, like sirens just being like I, take cover, right? Then you get the bells ringing. You get all the chaos of, of people trying to scramble to help put out the fire at the hospital. Like, it is chaotic. And then you get scenes, like, at the home where he's just moving around in bed and you hear, like, the bed springs. You hear him, like, go fill up a cup of water. Like, and there's nothing and There's nothing else happening. There's no, like, piano or backtrack to it. There's no, like, loud noises coming from downstairs to signify other people is here. It's, like, just him. And just yeah. these small little... Like, that is so strong to, to kind of contradict the beginning sequence. And, and again, what's happening during this time, the fact that it is World War II and that, you know, Japan is is losing the war at this point. Um, I, I think where my other strong piece to it and, and why I think this is one of the best sound design Ghibli Ghibli films to date, because uh, we know he's working on another couple, I think, um, is that when we do have music, it, it fits the tone of the scene. Because you get these small, you get these scenes where something's happening and they put like a small piano line to it. And then you yeah. get scenes where it's like a giant orchestra comes in. And and it matches with the impactfulness of the scene. And I think that's why, again, while the OST might not be the best, like you're not going to get a good ending song like Totoro or Ponyo, right? Uh, you still have these core elements of what you want in a, in a movie in terms of sound design. And it's it's heightened to a next level because of how well they they do it and how well they architected throughout the film. I I, I just yeah I can't get enough of it. Yep. Um, Drew, Drew had to leave. He Drew's Drew's gone. He had to leave, but he kept his camera on for us, so we appreciate that. Yeah. Um, just like <laughs> the end of the movie being abrupt, our ending to this episode is also abrupt. Thank you all for joining us this week. Uh, if you have a suggestion on what we should watch next, please send us it our way by emailing us or tweeting at us at Bakako Podcast, uh, our email at Bakako Podcast at gmail.com. Uh, we also want to thank Akano from SoundCloud for our intro song. But until next time, Spark Triumph. See you then. <laughs>